Cheers, mate. I still get that. The alias smile when I see your beautiful face, my friend. <laughs> it, true. It's quite true. It, yeah. True friendship, that. It's not it's not not diminished. We've not got the itch yet, son. No, no, mate. 20 years of going strong. We're doing well, brother. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> How are you anyway, sir? I feel like I've not seen as much of you recently because we well. You've been very busy with the BBC and all that sort of jazz, which is good. But... Yeah, it's all right, mate. It's fucking been yeah, a bit busy, but I've been in a shit week health wise and all that. I've had to send off a corona test today, which was, um, you know, you've seen Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory. Yes. You know, the sort of pain and anxiety that he goes through trying to get that chocolate bar. It was like that yes. with no sugar. Uh, and then by the end, I didn't feel like I'd got, I'm, I'm off to see Willy Wonka, but I've got a fucking sticker here, but up my, my nose. But um, yeah, fucking. You don't, have, you, have you had it? Is it you that's had a test, sorry? Uh, it's me and someone I live with, but I've, got, I've not had a test yet. I've had to, we, we couldn't get to a testing centre, so um, today well, I couldn't get anywhere uh, close by. I believe there's some free in Southampton or the Isle of Wight if you can not, you know, stop being lazy and just drive 800 miles, you'd be fine. Mate, I don't want to go in the, go in the car to the school with kids, never mind, drive to Southampton for a fucking test. I'm probably wrong, by the way. There probably isn't any tests in Southampton. Yeah. I but took my, a, um, yeah. sorry, go on, no, go on. No, yeah, so, so, so I couldn't, couldn't get through to, to like uh, anywhere online to book on and then they give me the option of the home test. So that should arrive uh, 8 o'clock tomorrow night. Uh, I've, I've just had an update to let me know it's in St. Helens. Uh, and then the thing I'm confused about is that I'm not allowed to leave the house, but it's given me destinations to go and deliver it to. So like, the, do I risk the 10 grand to get your COVID fucking, to get your it's COVID? Like it's more in this plan, isn't there? I know, yeah. I'll leave the house, but we, we've dropped the, the, the test down the road. So go I know what I'm going to do, though. I know what I'm going to do, though, Jay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, so I know I know, officer, but I'm breaking the law in a very limited and specific way. This is the key, mate. You know it. Limited and specific, as we discussed on the last podcast. <laughs> when I go shoplifting to minute me Pepsi Max Cheddar and we catch me. <laughs> It's limited and specific, you know, right? No, I um, I took my, it was, I don't know if we talk, spoke about this, we might have spoke about it off air, but um, my daughter had bites um, on her back from the garden. Um, and I can't remember, somehow it got back to the school, she had like these sort of, honestly, like marks on her back. And they yeah. were like considered symptoms, even though they were bites. And it was like, no sweat in the garden and got him. And the school like, oh, well, it's symptoms. did da She's got to get a test, and the other a brother and sister have got to stay off school while she has a test, which all right, I get. I'm not knocking the school yeah. it's safety first. And you know, if if they didn't act like that and then everyone got COVID, we'd all be up in outrage. So I know they're only doing the job, so I don't blame them at all. Um, so I took her to, funnily enough, near Old Trafford for the cotton buds up the nose, yeah. sort of thing. She, God knows what she must think. It's only three. Do you know what I mean? I told her we were going to Tesco to get a masham, and we're just stopping yeah. off on the way. <laughs> And then we went into the set. I just thought she didn't. She didn't bless her. She didn't even bat an eyelid. She was not. She was just like did it, did the thing. Went and got a mash, and that's all she was asked about. And then um, I got the result. I knew what it was anyway because I knew it was bites, not a symptom. And um, yeah. she had, you know, she. I know you can be asymptomatic, but she was fine. Um, and yeah, it came out negative. But it, you know, it's it must be like so confusing for kids because it's like what's going on here? Do you know what I mean? Like what is what is all this? Why yeah. you know why haven't why haven't we gone to school for six months? And why am I? I mean, well, cotton buds stuck up my nose in a tent near Old Trafford. It's just, um, yeah, it's bonkers. That's a, that, that's a struggle now, is it? They've just got back into school for like a week and a half and now we've got to keep them off school until we get the test results back, which, you know, sort of a kick in the teeth because trying to explain to them why they're not going to school tomorrow when well, obviously I've got to stay off. Everyone, everyone in the house has got to self-isolate. And we could be looking at, so when they get the results back, it could be two to four days until you actually get the result. And that means me and my missus are off work for a whole week. That's unpaid, you know, unpaid. And because you, know, you have to say fucking, there's no sick pay with it or anything like that. I'm not too fucking sure. But it's, minimum, it's minimal wage or whatever. I mean, that, that's by the by, they'd rather be healthy and stuff. But, you, you know, the, these sort of complications and knock-on effects and stuff like that, you can understand the reason why people who are more maybe in dire circumstances financially, whether they've got symptoms, but why they're sort of forced back into, you know, they, 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 they can't afford to basically stay off um, when, when they've got the disease. You can't, can you, man? It puts you in an awkward position, you know, for some people. I do sympathise with them because, you know, if you've got a family, you know, a lot of family, you're just, you know, you're just about managing financially and you've got to take a lot of time off work. You are going to be sort of tempted to fail. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you've got, if you, if you, if you, if you've got master, if you've got mortgage and rent bills and whatever that that have been behind anyway because you've been on lockdown for God knows how long. The last thing you want to be doing is taking is taking a week off work. 
Exactly, oh, man. Yeah, it's, it's just a, it's just a, a shit show. But we're going to get into all that anyway, aren't we, mate? You we are. We are it doing it. Yeah, in our right, usual sort of candor, candor and everything. But uh, yes, yeah, so this is, I'm downstairs today. So this is Scott. No, that's Motta. I'm Scott. This is the Scotty and Motty show. This is where we talk about all current events, usually political and things that tend to be going on in uh, pop culture, uh, both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, first thing to kick off with this week, back in the year 1997, uh, most of us were asking the question, how many special people change? Uh, and uh, this week, Noel Gallagher, well, I don't know if he's changed or maybe just shown his shown his true colours because, you know, we've, we've, uh, he, he's joined Ian Brown, uh, he's put the tinfoil Adidas Samba hat on and uh, said that he's completely against wearing uh, masks, he thinks it's a piss take. He thinks it's against his liberties and enough's enough now. If he gets it, then it's on him. Uh, and considering I imagine his man Peggy must be pushing 80 now, I wonder what her sort of thoughts on the on the event are. But one thing that I took away from this was that Ian Brown, his stance came from very sort of Tim Foyley, I've been smoking too much weed, there's UFOs in the sky sort of stance, whereas Noel Gallagher is more of a sort of, I'm a spoiled, selfish bastard who's had, who's had yes men surrounding me for the best part of my career. Uh, since the age of what 22, 23, um, and nobody told no one is just a very selfish, selfish response to it. And do you not think it's ironic that if you if you'd have asked me back in the 1990s, which frontman out of the Smiths, the Stone Roses, Oasis, in Happy Mondays would you to, would you be most politically aligned with in the 2020? You would not have said fucking Sean Ryder. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Ryder is my political guru. Um, mate, <laughs> that's a book. <laughs> know, yeah, fucking hell, a very short one. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm completely. With you. I don't really like No Gallagher, man. Um, and I'll explain why because I was as big of an Oasis fan as you could get. Been to see him a few times. Went to see him in Main Road. Went to see him in Nebworth. Went to see him in uh, Liverpool once. Um, sort of towards mid. We we spoke about this extensively. Me and you, yep. you know, they didn't do a bad song for years or one. You know, even the bad songs weren't that bad. And I, lo- I really loved Oasis and I thought Noel was a genius when I was growing up. But as I've got older, I just dislike him more and more. Um, and everything about him it's to the point now just annoys me. I just think he's a real, just a dickhead. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, everything, you know, he's, he's the old City thing, shtick gets tiring. You know, he used to be a Celtic fan until City started winning things and he's a Celt- uh, City fan all of a sudden. And it's like, okay, yeah, all right, whatever. And, you know, he's always in the changing rooms and celebrating and stuff like that. The whole Manchester's the best city on the earth as he sits in Belsize Park fucking boils me piss. Don't give me all that shit about how Mancunian yeah. you are and how you love Manchester when you couldn't wait to fuck off to London as soon as you made enough money. And then um, his politics as well, you know, he, he was one, and me and you have spoken about this. He might not be Jeremy Corbyn's biggest fan, but I get, I agree with a lot of what he said about um, social mobility and certain things and about austerity being bad and 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 sort of the the have and the have nots the gap between those getting wider yeah. and 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 that sort of um i those sort of ideals and then you remember he gave an interview and he said oh jeremy corbyn's a communist and all this shit and i just think mate you used to go on in the 90s about how you hated the tories and how you weren't this and now you are a tory you're just a massive tory do you know what i mean and there's nothing wrong right there, there is but if you're gonna be a tory right fair enough yeah yeah don't agree but i'm not mean you aren't but if you are all right, I get it, yeah? But don't come across like some sort of working-class socialist type, Labour-supporting, you know, man of the people, while saying everything that a Tory would say and doing everything that a Tory would do and acting like you're not. Just own it. Just, you know what I mean? That's what no Gallagher is. And even little things like when it's, you know, you look back now and you think, well, was he being cool and edgy or an arrogant or was he just being a bit of a dick and a bully? You know, you look at the way... I was watching the Supersonic documentary. I saw you at the premiere, you remember? And yeah. then, even then, you look at certain things when you look back on them and you think, do you know what? Actually, that was just a dickhead move. Like, the way he treated the drummer when he was doing uh, interviews, yeah. forgetting his name and slagging him off. And then you spoke about the drummer feeling like he was being, like, ostracised for no reason. Like the, Even, like, you know, the Michael Hutchins thing at the Brits, just being a knob. And I just think, you know what? He just strikes me as a proper bully victim, Noel. A proper bully victim who had loads of talent, made it, obviously made it massively, and now he's just acting out all the time. Do you know what I mean? And like you say, yeah, he's got loads of yes men who think he'd probably laugh at his jokes 
and think he's funny and tell him, yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah. You know, and even interviewers, I bet interviewers are like lapping up his nonsense. Oh, yeah, yeah, great stuff and all this shit. And I think he needs to be challenged more because he is, he's just, every time I see him do an interview or he's on, you know, I saw him on Graham Norton and Liam's done Graham Norton. Liam's not perfect, but at least Liam can be, you know, he's, he's pretty amusing and he's quite funny. And I saw like Nolan Graham Norton, I remember once, and he was just, Kevin Hart was on there and a few others, and they were really funny. And he was just like, it was cringe. You know, when he was, yeah. he was just cringe worthy. He just came across as like, you know, Uncle Nobed on, you know what I mean? In, in, on the couch of Graham Norton. And I just think the more he speaks, the less I like, like him. And I just wish he'd shut the fuck up for a bit. I really do. Yeah. Because, I mean, even, you know, I'm not a massive fan. Is he still doing high flying birds? I'm, I'm I don't, to, 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 to be honest, uh, his solo output um, for me, I've, I, I've liked a couple of singles. But aside from that, he's got, he's got all dis, he's, he's got all disco, and it's not about the music. <laughs> I know as well. <laughs> disco. I didn't see that one coming. I bet that's working out well. He's got all, he's got all disco, and then one of his singles, he had someone actually playing scissors on Jules Holland. He had, he had like girls just stood there doing this with scissors. Well, I call that fucking Barnet because he looks like KD Lang. It's terrible. I know, um, yeah. I mean, I can't um, say if I've got no hair, but still, come on. If he if he did have hair, though, you know. Yeah, I'd have a nice. Yeah, sure. exactly. Yeah. Nice pilot like you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just waiting for this to go like that. I've just got I've just got out of the bath. Um, but yeah, he, he always seems like he's just been trying to be a contrarian for the sake of it because he knows fine well that he knows he's, he's still playing that sort of old rock star. Oh, if I say edgy shit, I'll still keep in the media sort of thing, you know, and that, and that's why, that's why he keeps getting the, the interviews and Liam as well. And like Liam's very, and I met, I've, I've met Liam a fair few times and he's always very off the cuff with what he says. And he, I, you know, I don't think it's very premeditated. Whereas I think Noel knows what he's going to say when he, whenever he's got a microphone put in front of him, he knows fine well that he'll get the clicks and stuff. And that, that again, it's sort of self-perpetuating because the, the media will bring him back. Uh, the enemy were quite interesting this week because when Ian Brown came out slagging masks off, uh, the enemy went to town with him, called him a conspiracy theorist. When Noel Gallagher did it, it was all, oh, Noel's got this opinion. They didn't slag him off because they know that they, they, they know fine well that they need to play the game because they, that Noel Gallagher will, build, will bring an audience to his um to, to their website. But it's just it's just it's just sad. It's just an aging rock star. And this is what I mean when, when you say how many special people change. I think that me and you are the special people that have changed, and he hasn't because oh, that, that's what it is. You know what I mean? He's dated like soccer AM as Noel Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's a great, he has, mate. And it's a shame because, you know, like I can say Oasis were a big part of my adolescence and my early adulthood. They were, do you know what I mean? Nebworth is probably up there as, as good a gig as I've ever been to, and being brutally honest. And Main Road, yeah. you could probably throw that in as well. Absolutely cracking gigs. Um, but, you know, like you say, Liam Gallagher's not got, you know, not without his faults. I met him that night. I met you, the bumps into you, the premiere. I interviewed him that night. And he is what he is, you know. I mean, it's funny because I interviewed him for radio and um, I left, like, the, the cuts I'd taken out for the morning for the news. Yeah. And then um, my boss, remember when she spoke to me next day, he said, oh, it was really great. He said, it sounded a little bit like, you know, there was a lot of edits there. You know, you can tell because you've got an ear for radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, have you listened to the Raw? She was like, no, the Raw audio. And literally every other word was fucking... And it was yeah. just like fucking, man, fucking, man, fucking, fucking, man, man. so it's like he had to shut every single fucking other word. But he was, he was, he is what he is, Liam. And you know, when he's done stuff and said things, I didn't really agree with the sort of the fallout in the wake of the arena attack when Liam's doing a gig. I think he did one love, didn't he? Noel did the first gig at the arena after the attack, and then they and started firing shots. Yeah, yeah firing shots, and I think just have a fucking day off. Mm. It ain't about you and your, your stupid little argument. Do you know what I mean? No one cares. There's bigger things going on than this, and this isn't about that. And if they, they still couldn't help themselves. I think they've had the kids involved as well. I think there was some sort yeah, of... Yeah, partners and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it's just really distasteful, and it's just come, they come across both of them as a pair of spoiled brats, to be honest with you. Um, but no, even more so. And I agree with you. I think we see this trade on with aging rock stars. You hit the nail on the head when you said it earlier. You know, I forget people even fucking exist, These some of these old rock stars, until they spout this dribble. Like Roger Daltrey is probably one of the furthest people from my mind until he comes out and starts telling us all why we need to leave the EU. Do you know what I mean? And like, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I don't forget Ian Brown exists. I love, the, I love the guy, but when he's saying, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask and all this nonsense, you're like, all right, it's Ian Brown. And we all know that he's probably smoked more weed than most fucking men of adult dinners, but still, come on. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we I think 
the, the, the one positive in all of this is this isn't 1994 anymore. So these yeah. guys don't carry the weight that they used to. I think in 1994, if Noel Gallagher would have said this, I'd have probably listened to him, to be honest with you. I mean, I was only 14 at the time, but yeah. you'd have thought, oh, fucking hell not, because he was so big. And it was like, do you know what I mean? Like, wow. And now he's like, you, again, it's just like your drunken uncle at a wedding, isn't it? Just someone take the mic off him. That's what it is. It's like your da, isn't it? Or whatever yeah, they say, whatever the thing that is. Perfect, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. It's just that. And, you know, yes, they're trying to stay relevant and they're getting column inches and, like you say, the M- NME or whatever is lapping it up. But one day, you know, it's written in ink. One day you're going to look back at this and just think, I made a tit of myself. I don't, th- I don't think it will. I just think he's a, he's a fucking arrogant, arrogant man. And I know that I, 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 it was interesting to see the sort of fallout on social media. And because, you know, you follow, I think by and large, most of our sort of followers on social media are left wing. Um, and a lot of them were sort of slagging them off. But you still got the, the, the old sort of, the old boys who still got the haircuts and all that sort of stuff. You look at him like he's a god and all that. But he's not the messiah. He's a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I, but I was that was, that was Monty Python the le, the the long sight version there the Levin June version. So, <laughs> well, you know, I, we've had this conversation before isn't it? because I, I, I like my musicians when they play music. I like footballers by and large what they do on the football pitch outside of Sir Marcus Rashford, and I like my politicians to um, be honest. No, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> loving that one. <laughs> um, Talking of honest politicians, you flagged some up. We were chatting for Dido Ardin. Yeah, uh, for some to strange, some strange reason, I found myself to have an hour on TV uh, during the day, um, bizarrely when the kids were still in the house, and I watched it with uh, the Dido Ardin's uh, scientific interview. I can't remember the, the, what, what she'd been interviewed by and all that. And she, she was just squirming under uh, every single question. Well, that's under, that's under investigation. That's under investigation. And uh, there's a few takeaways from it. First, I can't get, I couldn't get past the fact that she looks like she's from a Brit pop act. Do you not think she looks like she's from a suede tribute I've band? A, I've got a thing here. I've got a picture of her. Hang on. Oh my. Yeah, she does. She is the, she's the fourth member of Supergrass, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But for those who don't know, right, Scotty, because I like to keep my finger on the pulse, and even I was a bit dado adding, yeah, isn't this the one that's been appointed as summit? Just elucidate us. What's the what's the script with dado adding? Okay, okay, so she's uh, she's still uh, an MP, but she's been given the in charge of. The, she's a, I think she's a, is a backbencher MP, and but she's also been given in charge of this thing that's taken over not the NHS. What is it? What's the new what's the new regime called? The new health system. Um. Yeah, that's a good. <laughs> well, let, so, um, let me let me find it. Um, it's not it's not public well, health England, is it? So, so well, it's they, now well, yeah, N- yeah, NH- NIHP. Um, yeah, NIP. NIP. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the National Institute for Health Protection. Yeah, so she, she so she, so so she, she, they're saying that she shouldn't be well, uh, the opposed and uh, saying that she shouldn't be able to straddle both roles because obviously there's a conflict of interest when she's making certain decisions when she's in, in, in charge of the mass of the healthcare but when everything was sort of put towards her <clears throat> she couldn't answer a fucking question um and they're saying like well, well we, we we do believe that we're going to get to a million uh tests a day by december uh, and, well, and what, what do you basis and then whoever was interviewing us like what's your basis on because we're struggling at the moment trying to get to it oh well we're, we're just very confident i'm like you know would you would you would you bet your job on it <laughs> yeah well let's have a let's have a get let's yeah. have a wager now right get, get, i'll get, bet you if you don't you get you have to yeah. resign get your, nando, you get, get your nando's chart out with all the fucking different spices and tell us how hot oh, you think you are that's going to get that and then matt hancock was on my this morning mm. uh did you see that i saw that at- i saw um jen williams on it when she <laughs> from the men um as well um before him who's one of the best journalists out there really um but yeah, I saw and then I saw the follow-up. He was on it and the interview. I mean, he does this thing, Martin Cock, doesn't he? Where you give him a fact, an undeniable fact, and he he, he uses terms like "that's not how I see it" or "I reject it." So he'll say things like, you know, our reaction has been a shambles, and you know, ninety percent of the people that need PPE, PPE haven't been getting them, and you yeah. know, the deaths in care homes are rife, and you know, people can't get a test or. You have, you know, the tests that you're sending out, a lot of them aren't, aren't usable and, and the, the figures that you've got are all wrong. And when you're saying that, you know, the capacity doesn't mean anything because some of those 
test can't be used. And he'll say things like, well, I reject that. That's not how I see it. Those aren't the figures that I've got. He just lies on the, yeah. in the interview. And then you'll see, like, you know, you'll Google it or whatever, or you'll check, and it's it, it's false. So when he's, he's faced with the facts, he just denies it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, it's, you know, today's Sunday morning. No, it's not. That's not what I've got. But it is. It's fucking yeah. Sunday. Well, you know, that's what you've got. I've got something different. What are you on about? Do yeah. you know what I mean? Like, what what the fuck are you talking about? But that's what he does, and he sort of gets away with it because once the interview's yeah. over, yeah, you know, you know what I mean. He leaves and goes away. So he might look like a twat when you look back at it and go, actually, what he said there was wrong, and that was wrong, and this was wrong. But at the time, he's sort of getting away with it. Do you know what I mean? Even Ma today, I didn't think really held his feet to the fire enough. I know today at the time of recording, when you're watching this, it's probably yesterday or whenever, but. I just felt, and I'm not Mars' biggest critic. I know he gets a lot of stick. I don't mind him as much as other people do. Um, but I just felt that he let him off the hook a little bit. And I think that, that you know, these are undeniable facts. Hit him with them more. Do you know what I mean? And when you say you've got facts, and then he says, well, that's not what I've got. I think, and he says things like, you know, you'll say, oh, 14,000. He'll say, well, those figures aren't, aren't quite right. And it turns out it's like 14 or, or 13,973 yeah. or something. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, he's been so disingenuous and slippery. And listen, I get being a health secretary during a pandemic is a pretty thankless task. It's very difficult. It's unprecedented. I get that. But that doesn't disguise the ineptitude that we've seen. And not just the ineptitude as well, the corruption. You're appointing people that you know full well aren't the best people for the job because it's politically and financially advantageous to you and your friends. And that is criminal. That's not you're doing your best. Like our yeah. mate who threw it back in our face, Kay Burley said, after we praised her. Oh, he's doing his best. He's trying to save lives. Fuck off. No, he's not. So, yeah, I get it. It's difficult, but that doesn't excuse it at all. And, yeah, you know, the appointment of Dido Harding, it, it, it stinks of, like, over the pond. We talk about what goes on in a minute. You know, when it was like Betsy DeVoe was put in charge of schools, whatever it was, an education. Yeah. And she just had a fucking, she didn't have a jar of glue about anything and she was just getting grilled in the Senate or wherever it was and or Congress and she just was, it was just a, a joke how little she knew about yeah. what she was in charge of. And now, you know, we're seeing this over here because we are the Aldi version of Donald Trump, aren't we really? With our <laughs> politics. It says it all really. Um, yeah. But, you know, we're, we're sort of following suit and just appointing these people because... It's jobs for the boys or jobs for the girls in this case. Oh, mate, yeah. I mean, and just just to back on the the jobs for the boys thing. So she was she was challenged on uh, the people that have been given the task for PPE or the um, the health health advice and stuff. And they were saying like uh, they give an example and said, "Well, so and so is being paid five hundred pound an hour. Uh, could you let me know what what that's be what is being paid five hundred pound an hour for? I'll have to look into that." Okay, uh, and, and she, that, that, was, that was all she did. I, and, and that's what happens when they're up on the, under the microphone. They haven't got the answers there. And they just, you can just see, because the, the, they're, they're all of the same sort of school, aren't they? The, the training is just, you know, you, you very sort of SAS, the way they sort of fall in line, like that power stance and the way they sort of squirm out of questions. It's so, it's so well rehearsed. And you have Pretty Patel, who walks around like fucking shaggy, saying it wasn't me. Have you seen the way when she reacts to certain things? That's the sort of lock scored. Well, you know, it wasn't me. You know, that's the sort of <laughs> she's so honestly, she's a horrible, horrible person, pretty Patel. Mm. Um, we've spoken about her a few times, but she's she's absolutely vile. Um, from what we gather as well, like just to meet her, a lot of people complained. You remember all the civil servant complaints she had about her attitude and the way she spoke to people. She was a bit of a bully, um, and not nice to be around. And you could maybe forgive it slightly if she was great at her job and keeping us all safe and that but she's not and it's just you know these the policies that she oversees and the attitudes she has and the comments she makes she's just it's just it's just so disheartening and and i sometimes i think i, I kick myself for being so naive that you still hold on to that bit of hope don't you that maybe you'll get people in government that care about us that will try and do the best for us that try and look out for us and we haven't got that at all. We've just got selfish, arrogant, nasty bastards who are just out to try and make a bit of cash and, you know, keep the plebs in the place. And it's, yeah. it's just deflating all the time, man. And it is, and it's like, I just, 
you know, you want something better. You want better options. What did you think of uh, Starmer on Andrew Mar? By the way, did you stick around for his interview? I didn't. I didn't see Starmer. I, I, I think Starmer's an, an improvement on Jeremy Corbyn in, in that he won't be so divisive. But um, just to take away from the politics, I always think I'm watching an episode of The Bill. He just looks like he. He just looks like he's walked out of Sun Hill. You know? <laughs> Fuck you, mate. I tell you what though, he was fucking like you, mate. Dido hard in there today in his interview. I mean. I, I want, I always say this, I want to like Keir Starmer more than I do. I'm sort of a little bit on the fence with him. I don't quite think he's he's got it, but he's obviously he's a better option than Boris Johnson, but fucking hell, traffic cone's a better op- option than Boris Johnson. Yeah. But he was, you know, it's so wishy-washy at times, and I think he's playing it too safe, Keir Starmer. And I get that because this government is just imploding and they're making these decisions and everyone's falling out of him. And I think he's neck and neck now in the polls, so you could argue mm-hmm. it's working for him because... Boris Johnson's always been able to maintain that gap. But you just want a little bit more from him. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. a little bit more passion, a little bit more, you know, I'm not saying he's not a fucking human, but sometimes he comes across like a cyborg. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And it's like, we've had all that with Ed Miliband and all the others. Just show us something, man. Do you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, it's, 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 I don't know, man. I, I'm, trying, I'm trying hard to get on board, but I'm not quite there yet. I mean, don't get I, me wrong. I prefer, yeah. like I said earlier, you know, if there was a vote tomorrow, I'd probably vote for him because he's a better option than Boris Johnson, but I'd do it like, you know, with my lip out. Yeah. yeah the thing is, Starmer might be playing the long game, you know, because... Yeah, I get that. that. Yeah, it's a good point. I, there, yeah. I, I, think, I think, well, I did, I did see some of the answers and he just he, he refused to sort of uh, give any answers from a Labour point of view, didn't he? Because he said, I don't think now is the time. And, and that seems to be his byline a lot of the time. I think what he's letting Boris, Boris Johnson do, and I think we touched on this previously with Joe Biden... Uh, and Donald Trump is allowing Boris Johnson to be his own undoing because I think a lot of the backbenchers and Tory MPs are sort of losing their faith with everything that's going on with the EU negotiations in Northern Ireland. So for Keir Starmer to maybe try rock the boat, if, if he's if he's already gaining traction um, in the polls, then you, you stick to your form, don't you? You know, like like you, like if you're in a football analogy, if your team's if your strategy is getting you the results that you want, then you don't really change. You don't you don't really change until you need to. When it's yeah. that's need to rank, ranking it up to get the the populist vote will probably be coming more towards the, the time of the election. So, you know, as much as I don't think he's, uh, is, is, um, you know, he's not as enjoyable or not as enjoyable. You, you, you don't warm to him as much as maybe you would a Jeremy Corbyn. He's not, you, you don't empathise with his personality. I can sort of see maybe the reason he's doing for it. I mean, he's a clever bloke, and he says, what was he? It was his solicitor, wasn't it? So you can sort of... And yeah, he, and, and, he didn't run the head of public prosecutions or something. He was like one yeah. of the chief prosecutors. Um, yeah, I mean, he obviously very, very intelligent man. I'm not disputing that. Um, and I, I, I get the sense that his heart's in the right place. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I don't think, you know, where you could argue that Boris Johnson's heart isn't, that he's is out to make what he can and, and make his chums what they, what they can and keep the grouse hunting going. Um, I don't King think, uh, yeah. I've never seen a grouse. I was thinking about this. Where, where, the, where, where do you see grouse? Or uh, it's quite, you don't come on here and start fucking bullshit, right? Me and you used to go grouse hunting constantly. So there's no point in pretending it. We, That's when we got out of, yeah, for old grouse, not fucking. <laughs> <laughs> famous right. grouse, more like yeah, at five yeah, a.m. Famous, in the kitchen. Oh, do you yeah. know what? I've got to tell you something. Actually, I forgot. I forgot this. I can't believe I forgot it. We was doing the uh, the live watch along the other day. On De- uh, I was at Devil's Head on Park, uh, Stratford Paddock, and um, for the Palace game, which we will not talk about. Mm-hmm. And um, I was chewing because I've not had my dinner. Uh, I've been doing this charity thing before, and then it was like a live charity thing for two hours, and I've gone straight to watch along. So I was chewing, and when I was just chewing, like my me, me thing was going on the side of my head. So Steve Alson, who did the thing with, was like, Look at Jay, look at your head there. Like, you tune, and then they all start joking, all that, Joel, like, you've done that a few times, haven't you? And I said, yeah, many a time in the kitchen at 4 a.m., you know, <laughs> what I need, what I get into, tuna fishing, right? Because I remember what me and you were talking about, and I, I, you know, I'd said that. And then tuna fishing took over the fucking watch along, and they're all arguing about tuna fishing for, like, a good, like, it kept coming up every five minutes in the watch along, because obviously the game was terrible, and yeah. how much tuna cost, and then the Googling how much tuna, and Joe was like, you can't make any money out of tuna. Adam McCall was like, no, you can't, it's worth a lot. Then someone went and got a tin of tuna, Housen's waving it, reading it, Mate, honestly, they lost the fucking wow. mind. And I remember thinking, like, little did I know, in 1998 or whenever, when I was in the kitchen in fucking Beswick at 4am, chatting shit to my new best mate, whose name I can't even remember, about we want to get into tuna fishing, that whatever it is, 23 years later or 22 years later, dominate a watch-along for it, mate. They were obsessed. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's not a good advertisement for the fucking football, is it? No, mate. That was that's how bad it got. We spent honestly, we spent more time, and people getting in on the comments as well about the chicken. <laughs> not in a bad way. I'll tell you what, he's got a good idea there. Yeah. Um, sorry, I digress. Anyway, my friend. Um, yes. Starman. David Cameron. Oh, yeah. David so Cameron. Yeah. What's yeah, Cameron don't... been up to, man? Has <laughs> right, so he, I think, has I he think not Cameron... found his fucking rocks to crawl back under yet? Or what? And stayed there? Uh, fucking pig to climb into. Uh, he's, um, yeah. yeah he's, he, I think he released a, a new book or he added a new chapter to his biography. Uh, and a snippet of, it, snippet of it came out last week. And it was along the lines of uh, austerity, maybe the saving grace that we've had in this pandemic. So, what he was basically saying is the amount of money that the Tories rifled away into their cabinets and, and uh, the, uh, put, put onto the money tree is the reason now why Rishi and Co can afford to um, to, to give everybody money while they're on furlough and stuff. That, 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 that's pretty much what he, the, the, the line that he was trying to, you know, trying to spin. Uh, and I was like, that's very, very interesting. So, that's, that's that, like, do you know what that's like saying? Well, you know what? If it wasn't for Hitler, we'd have more people now suffering in this pandemic. So you could argue he did a good job. That is that sort of fucking argument. And yes, I'm going straight to Nazism. I am. Because it's that fucking ridiculous to claim that austerity, which decimated communities, right, massively. And I saw this firsthand as a reporter. And I saw short sure centers closing down. I saw, saw even like libraries, you know, even libraries, people go to libraries, use a computer to get jobs and shit like that. Libraries closing down. I was in council meetings where they had to shave millions and millions of pounds off a budget that, that was already stretched to its fucking limits. See mental health suffering across towns and cities and people really, really struggling, suicidal and, you know, the lot, mate, yeah. seriously. And it was all a political decision. It did fuck off the economy. And now he's coming out now when people are probably feeling worse than they felt since austerity and saying, do you know what? Thanks to me, it's, it's better than it, it, it could have been. Fuck yeah. off, mate. Seriously, that is an absolute piss take. And he needs to fuck off, seriously. No one needs to hear from him ever again. No, hey, hey man, Tony Blair. But I was thinking, if, if if there's any truth in that, and that money that was saved uh, through, the, through, through austerity, then surely after the pandemic, we should be back on an even keel, then we shouldn't need to go into austerity again, by that logic. That's a great shout, yeah. And you know full well that what will happen now after the pandemic... <laughs> Is I personally, I mean, you've discussed this uh, on other podcasts, so I won't go into details. I think we'll see the full privatization of the NHS. That'll begin. And, also, and um, sorry, the pandemic will be blamed for it. We're already seeing certain things like Operation Moonbeam, whatever the fuck it was called, which is going to take up a good chunk of the NHS budget. I think it'll be used as an excuse, as I've said earlier, to sort of start getting rid of the NHS. That's always been a long term Tory goal. Don't care what anyone says. It is. Yep. They didn't want it. They didn't want it in the fucking first place when Clement Attlee started it, and we spent whatever it's been seventy five years trying to get rid of it. So that'll be one thing. You're right. Austerity will come in. Things like just you know the welfare state. They'll they'll decimate that in any way that they can. You know unemployment benefits stuff like that. They'll 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 take them from under you. And don't think for one minute. Don't buy into this old Rishi Sunak. He's a fucking oh man. You know he's got his arm round you. And he's all right. He's a good guy and all this shit. He's going to look out for you. No, I'm not having it, man. I'm not. But and people say, oh, well, Perlo was a great thing. And we're, uh, this. They did what they had to do to keep the going. Yes, yes, exactly. There's, so uh, I nearly got into a, a comment row on one of our previous podcasts when I was saying that the Tories have pretty much failed along everything that they've, they've attempted. And someone on one of our comments said that, yeah, well, Rishi got us the money or some, something along them lines. And I was close to sort of, I wrote the tweet, I wrote the message out and I thought, I can't be fucked getting into that worm, into, into an argument with someone I don't fucking know. I know uh, I, I argue with people that I know enough. Um, and then, but, but that's what it was. It was to save the country, to keep going. And that's why we rushed back open again, to save the economy. It, it, was, it, it, was, it wasn't a selfless act in, by any stretch of the imagination. And don't be, don't be fooled. Every single thought, uh, every single move that the Tories are making, I calculated, even down to... Down to now, even though I might, might get me fucking tin foil out. And when you look at Dominic Cummings doing that and, and uh, going up to fucking whatever the castle, what's it called? The castle. Barnard Castle. Barnard Castle. And then the repercussions then of everybody going out are massive. Now, now we're going to have a lockdown, which I think is fucking inevitable. 
and people aren't because uh, people aren't abiding by the rules and all pointing back to him. But ultimately, the fingers will come back from talk from the government and say, "Well, we've given you enough. Um, we, we, we give you the guidelines. This is what you need to be doing. The the onus is on you." And if you've looked over the last two three weeks when the when the number of cases have been going up. Their, 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 their um, line they've been coming out with in the media changes with every two or three days. It was, we're definitely not going to have a national lockdown. We're not going to have a national lockdown. Three days later, it was, a national lockdown is the last thing that we need to do. We, nobody wants to do that. It's the nuclear option. Today on Andrew Maher, um Matt Hancock came out and he said that, uh, well, national lockdown might have to be the option if people can't keep down to the the, the, the social distancing. So they're already trying the blame game. It, 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 blame. Uh, yeah. And, that, and, and that's exactly, and that's and that's what they're doing all the way through it. And I'll, 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 I'll be amazed. I'll be fucking amazed if that furlough option is there for this this lockdown. Exactly. I mean, you look at furlough, and you know, <laughs> yes, I get it. It benefited a lot of people. We needed something, and, and we got that. But like you say, it, it wasn't a selfless act. It wasn't because the, you know they thought, oh, these poor people. It was because they needed to keep the economy going. And and the the worry that they'll have is that you get into a position where socialism is needed to save us all, when it has to become like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like the economy has gone to shit. People aren't working. It, we almost turn into a sort of like a socialist state. Do you know what I mean? And so they want to keep the economy going. They want to keep it like capitalist. So they're going to have to do that. And they're going to have to do it to the sort of almost minimum they can do it before it gets untenable. So I, th- I just think that... Um, I think that, yeah, too many people bought into that straight away when he was doing that, when Rishi Sunak was doing that. Oh, he's a great guy, future prime minister. No, he's not, right? Let's just put that one to bed. The Tories are never going to put him as their leader, and we all know why, right? doesn't matter how many fucking, you know, mates he's got in that party. He's you know, he's the wrong yeah. guy for him. And, you you know, I mean, I don't need to explain <laughs> that one unless you're a fucking absolute idiot. That's never going to happen. Because he but, drinks too much Yorkshire tea. Is that yes, what that's, that's see, I mean, Scott, you know, you knew what I was on about. Um, so, yeah, so this whole, like, oh, it was such a, an almost benevolent thing they did. And, you know, I mean, how generous are they? No, it wasn't. They did what they had to do to keep this economy going. They pushed us back out there to the fucking, what was the thing we were talking about the other day? Um, eat out to help out. And then blamed us when the, 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 the spikes went up. And I saw what you're saying about my Hancock. I think he was asking about Oldham. You know, you're putting in these measures and why aren't they working as well? People aren't abiding by them. Yeah. So you're blaming the people when your own fucking advisor, the man who's more or less de facto prime minister and leader of this country, Dominic Cummings, like you said, went and tested his eyesight by driving to a castle 30 miles away with his kids in the car. Do me a favour. Do you know what I mean? He completely undermined any sort of authority they had and any sort of right they have to blame other people. And I get that some people are not abiding by the rules but you've already set the the president for that with this this ridiculous action and this ridiculous press conference he gave afterwards in the fucking rose garden of wherever it was in downing street which was like an x-factor audition where people yeah. came up and asked him questions and he just gave the same stupid answer to all of them and then in the end it was like all oh, right you know well that was out of order but you know carry on no yeah he should have been sacked I- and the thing is now is that I, I I was reading a poll and it was saying that people are more divided now over lockdown and the to wear a mask, the believe in COVID vaccine. Is that you know we seem to be more broken as a society now in terms of different opinions than we were over Brexit. Do you know what I mean? And when, when you're trying to pick conversations with people now, it's like you have that many sort of disagreements on on, on so many on variety of stuff. I've had to come away. From, I watched that. Have you watched that social dilemma? recently we've seen it on netflix what's that mate Sorry. it's brilliant so basically it basically breaks down it's like all former employees of the likes of twitter instagram and facebook and it shows how how uh you should definitely watch it how it manipulates the psychology of the user and basically it turns you into sort of an addict and why uh, your certain things are popping up into your timeline and how you're kept on there and stuff and it's really eye-opening and why you're having certain arguments so i've come off it and I, 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 I like, I, I found out of like a loophole. If you, if you come off Facebook and then go back on, you seem to be in a different sort of algorithm. You'll know about algorithms on Facebook and stuff. If you do the same thing on Twitter, all of a sudden your like uh, trends and all that seems to be seems to be reset. So you get you get a whole load of different people who are popping up on your on your timeline than you usually would. But because of how you usually interact, that's why you see certain things, and that's why, uh, by and large, under the Jeremy Corbyn um, Boris Johnson election in December. 
you would believe that Jeremy Corbyn was well within going to win win it because everybody that you know, all you could see was Jeremy Corbyn and yeah, it was very yeah. much like an echo chamber. And it's just, just really fucks with your psyche. But like, just, I, just back to the whole uh, divisive stuff, it's like picking conversations now with people. It, it just, I, I, I've, I'm really, really at my fucking wit's end with fucking society as a whole because I was like walking around, I was, like, I was in my local uh, banging new Thai takeaways open the other week and I was in there, I was in there with a mask. And the guy, there was three guys in there uh, turned around and looked at me like I was a fucking, like I was the oddball. And, and it was definitely because I was wearing a mask, do you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, I was like, I'm trying to do the right thing here, but you're making me feel intimidated as well, I'm doing one the wrong thing. One sec, one sec. Anyway, I'll keep talking to you. Maybe you will or he won't edit this out, but thanks everyone that's following us so far. We have 993 right. followers uh, if you could tell your mates, we are seven off one thousand. Jay doesn't think we're going to get it before October. I do yeah. have faith in you people. He's just a pessimist. I anyway, was in go. I was in Tesco. Was right. I I was in my car. And I'd done um. I'd I'd been to do uh to do delivery for my missus' thing, and um, I um I stopped off at Tesco. I had to get some bits, and I couldn't find my mask. Cause I was wearing shorts. It was quite warm today, so I changed my jeans for once. So I wear like the same jeans for like four days and swap them for my other pair of jeans and then I do the same thing. <laughs> Might as well, mate. Hey, and uh, I managed to find a mask in the door. Is this? Uh, so nice. I'm in Tesco, right? I'm in Tesco. <laughs> ah, my mask's gone. Makes me stick out as well. And I was wondering, like, why is everyone looking at me funny? Because I've seen quite a pe- few people and I'm thinking, fucking cheeky twats. I suppose, why yeah. is people with masks, even people wearing masks are looking at me like, what's in there? I realise I'm wearing a bloody child's rainbow mask. But it works. I was yeah. covering. Do you know what I mean? My that's like the- a twat, but I'm keeping people safe. And yeah. it's not that's me. Lens- yeah, that's your lens you'll go to. Well, take yeah, no I mean- fucking no, Gallagher. Take no, get a yeah. rainbow fucking face mask. Fuck, you know, acting like some hero because he's willing to kill other people. Oh, my God. You know. Oh, wow. You're not Charlie yeah. Manson. I know. Say what you want to be a hero, move out of Bell Size Park, move back into Burnage, and fucking start acting like a proper man cooning instead of spouting drivel on the side. <laughs> um, but yeah, mate, I'm with you, and I, I, you know, I don't listen to the government blindly, as we all know. But the, the, the experts or the health people are saying, you know, wear a mask and just protect other people. And fuck me, even yeah. if you've got that one wrong, I can live with it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like Ian Brown, and not to go back to the beginning, but Ian Brown went yeah. as far as to, to release a single um, about how much he is against Bill Gates, because uh, he believes it's all Bill Gates that's, that, that's, that's you know, causes bat, bat virus. Um, but you're not like Bob Dylan fighting against racism, are you? You know, you, you no. pick, pick your battles. Like, you Come know, you know when you're, at the, you're at the Pearly Gates and St. Peter's asking what you did for humanity. Oh, and I wrote this song about fucking cotton masks, mate. It was a banger, big seed, little tree or whatever the fuck it. Oh, get, yeah, you're going down, mate. Down, down, down. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I don't mean a load of tone, but it has been a dark time recently. And one of the um, the sort of, one of my biggest fears, right, with all the with American politics and what's going on, was that um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was on her last leg, Supreme Court Justice, I think she was 87, had cancer, would die before the election. And that's happened. Uh, um, she's a progressive voice, a liberal, on a Supreme Court, always voted the liberal way, um, big on human rights, civil rights, women's rights, you, you know, any sort of progressive right, you name it, she was on it. And America and the world's lost a real important figure. Um, now, I'm sure you'll know, but if you don't, Supreme Court justice is a life appointees. Once they're, they're in it, they're, they're in it till they die. Um, I think there's nine Supreme Court justices, and they vote on things like major things. Now, you look at the 2000 election, the recount in Florida. Whoever wins Florida wins the election. The recount, Bush won it, but it looked like Gore. Some of the votes were a bit. Suspicious because they'd have that sort of ch- chid thing or chud thing, whatever it's called, I forget the name of it, where you're pressing down bits of paper and it's a bit of confusion. So they started doing a recount, and the more they recounted it, the more it started shifting towards Gore, which was going to hand him the election. It looked like it goes to the Supreme Court on whether they should continue the recount. And the Supreme Court voted, I think, five to four to stop the recount. Bush gets a presidency. So they have a massive amount of control over in America. They have the checks and balances in America, you know the judicial, the executive yeah. um, and legislative branch. And obviously Supreme Court is part of that. Um, and 
what you know they make laws they change laws they can you know i make these massive decisions and it's been sort of even because even though there is more conservatives to the liberals sometimes i think the one conservative one of the conservatives votes the liberal way sometimes and votes against trump and stuff but now trump wants to bring in obviously a more conservative vote uh judge there's this talk now of pushing the vote through before the election because if he loses the election biden will put a progressive voice on there to replace ginsburg and rightly so there's a lot of shit going on in america about whether trump's gonna be able to do it and the sort of the, the dodgy thing is in 2016 when I think it was George Anthony Scalia died, um, and who oh, was it that um, Obama wanted to appoint? Was it Merrick? Oh, I forget what her name was. Forgive me. Um, yeah, Obama. He wanted to um, appoint. Oh, fucking hell, I can forget her name here now. Sorry, um, Merrick Garland. That was it. Yeah, he wanted to appoint Merrick Garland, and then the Republicans who control the Senate because this. The um, I said I forgot her name. Merrick Garland, the man, um, control the Senate wouldn't let him, even though it's the, the president's right to nominate someone. They wouldn't let him because they wanted to wait till after the election. Obviously, Trump wins the election, um, and he gets his appointee in. So now we're in the, the reason that the Republicans said they wouldn't is because they said it's an election year and it's only right that you wait until after the election. Now this is literally weeks before the election. It's the same scenario. But this is obviously the time that the Republicans control the Senate, so now they're changing the tune and saying, well, actually, you can do it. So what could happen here now is there's lots of ifs and buts and maybes, but if Trump gets his way, gets his nomination in, gets voted for, you could have a very conservative Supreme Court. They could overturn certain things like Roe versus, uh, Roe versus Wade, sorry. So things like abortion rights could go out the window, a woman's yeah. right to choose, because the conservatives are very much pro-life, as they say, which is just a, another word for saying anti-abortion. So that could change, that laws around that can change, which, you know, personally, I'm what you call pro-choice. I think uh, a woman has a right to uh, to choose if she wants to abort a baby, or not baby, some cells. Um, and then that could shift. You can see a conservative shift. You can also see that the Supreme Court, just if Trump does win the election, or even if he loses the election and it has to go to the Supreme Court, they're handing yeah. it to him. So it's very dodgy. It's very disheartening because not only have they lost this progressive voice, her dying wish on her deathbed was that a vote to replace her didn't take place until after the election. That's literally what she told, I think, her daughter or her granddaughter. And Trump, as soon as she's died, he's saying, in her name, to one of her memory, oh, we must act oh, quickly. Oh. It stinks of Joe Cox and Brexit all over again. You know when yeah. Boris Johnson was saying, let's get Brexit done because it's what Joe Cox would have wanted when she literally wanted the opposite of that. So it's horrible and it's scary. And I know there's a lot of Americans out there now, liberal minded, even decent minded, or you know, progressive types will be like, you've lost this icon, and now you're gonna have the Supreme Court stacked six to three in conservative favor. There are ifs and buts, some Republican senators might not vote because even though they control the Senate, I think they've got a 53 to 47 majority or whatever. So if a few go the other way, it might not happen also there was this talk today of nancy pelosi who's the um obviously the house leader in in congress who's a democrat that she could even impeach donald trump again and it could delay the, the because they take impeachment proceedings it delays the supreme court vote so uh, after the election uh, nice. so there's some you know i mean i'm you don't care what you have to do just do it but yeah. yeah it's it's just it adds to that sort of Kicking the teeth at 2020 keeps giving us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, right. it should, 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 I mean, it just amplifies the dirty tactics and the lengths that someone like Donald Trump will go to uh, if he's going to do it. You know, dishonor the, someone's death wish. He uh, was such an esteemed character in uh, American politics. And I was looking at the. Uh, I seen this because. Uh, I sent you a message, didn't I, last week? I was saying, I hate you, you bastard. I had no interest in American politics until we started doing this. So I don't. So even if any of our close to 1,000 subscribers aren't to American politics, you've converted me, and I'm watching Sorry. American politics I, I picked the wrong time to do it. I should have done it in 2008 when we had a bit of hope. I was there, I was there for Obama, man. This is just depressing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I've seen that. I think it's it. Is it Amy Amy Barrett who's the – she's one of the favourites to um, – Yeah, I think – is she the um, – she, she's, she's, she's a devout Catholic, and I think she's the one that's anti-choice. And I think if the one she, if she gets in, that they, they are fearful that they will take away um, women's rights regarding if they should or shouldn't have children. But there's also an interesting uh, one. I think it was Barbara – Lagoa, who was the first um, first Hispanic woman to serve on the Florida Supreme Court, which is originally from uh, Cuba, 
which was, but she was put there by Donald Trump, which I thought was quite interesting given his um, his views on ethnic minorities. Well, it's quite interesting to say this because Trump has a bit of a, a somewhat strange relationship with Hispanic people. Um, and it's not as clear cut as you think because it's easy to dismiss him. He said things like, you know, bad hombres and rapists and things like that about Mexicans. I shouldn't laugh because it's not very funny. Um, when he's talking about Mexicans coming over and Hispanics. But there is a section of the Hispanic community that, that are sort of on board with him a little bit. A lot of the Hispanic community are business owners and some of those business mm. owners like what he does in terms of taxes and things. And I think it's always important to remember this. I mean, you've spoken about this a lot on our podcast. You know, when people, it annoys me when people say the black vote. He's going to get the black vote. I'm a black person. You know, um, I've got lots of black people I know, black friends I know, who have very different opinions to me on all sorts of issues, different needs, different priorities, different, you know, sort of points of view. We don't all go down to the polling station on election day and vote in exactly the same yeah. way because it's all about the black vote. Vote, You know, like Sol Campbell came out once, didn't he, and said, I can get the black vote for the Tories. And I thought, what are you on about? Not only can you not get the black vote for anyone because that's impossible, but what makes you think you're such a voice that black people are going to go, oh, Sol Campbell's voting Tory now, I better do that. John, um, John, John Barnes has got more of a chance. <laughs> Barnes, fucking you know. hell. I wouldn't trust John Barnes to put a cross in a, tit, uh, cross in a box, to be honest with you. you probably fucking get that wrong. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's frustrating. But, yeah, so with the Hispanic thing, it is a little bit odd. Um, you know, there's, there's, Trump's very good at sort of wheeling out certain people to show how progressive he is. You know, he'll have yeah. Kanye West round to his house to show that he's down with the black people, even though Kanye West is obviously going through a lot of issues that we don't need to go into now. So it'll be, say, interesting to see what happens with this. It's going to be another horrible period, I think, in not just American politics, but politics in general. I can see there being some fuckeries. Yeah. During the election, if the election doesn't go his way, I can see him turning to Supreme Court, which he may now control a lot more of, and saying, uh, help me out here. Uh, and if it overturns a Democratic vote, then there's going to be hell to pay. I don't know how likely that is. I saw Bob Woodward on um, Andrew Ma this morning. We were talking about that when we were, at the time of recording. It was this morning. And he was saying, you know, you just sort of expect the unexpected, really. We don't know what's going to happen, what Trump's going to do, because obviously he's just written this book on Trump. Um, where Trump's kicking off because Bob Woodward used the exact quotes that Trump said because it was recorded and he didn't like that um, because he just made himself look like the whopper he is. So, yeah, it's it's just it's just sad and, saddening and fear, um, sort of scary, which is sort of the the, the, the times we live in and it, it adds to that really, doesn't it? So, yeah, we'll have to see what yeah. goes, up, goes down. Like, and the thing is, he came out as well this week and he said that um, it'll definitely be a, it'll be a, a woman who's going to replace uh, Ginsburg and then, weirdly, he said, that I, 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 I like women, I prefer women to men. And that was the same week when uh, the model Amy Doris has come forward with more sex allegations against the President of the United States. It's like, how much shit do you need to throw at someone before it sticks? Seriously. seriously. Can you I'm, imagine, I, I, mate? Can you imagine? You want to talk about equality and progressiveness and all that, right? <clears throat> People say, oh, Barack Obama's president, so, you know, he's obviously progressing. No, no Barack Obama, right? was practically the most perfect man you could get when he entered the White House. He didn't have any skeletons in his closet. He hadn't done anything bad. He hadn't had any affairs. He'd been married his, you know, the woman. He had kids with um, Michelle. He was a Harvard Law professor. He'd studied hard. He'd worked his way up. He, you know, he hadn't been handed anything to him. He was like Mr. Boy Scout. Mm. And that's how he became president. Now, if Barack Obama had been married like three times, had a load of divorces, and had multiple affairs, five different kids to different women, had dodgy business dealings, declared himself bankrupt for six, six times, and still became president, then I'd say yes, there's equality in America. But he wouldn't have got near the nomination if he had no. any of those. If he had women coming out saying he's a rapist and he attacked him, or if he'd been caught on, on audio saying, oh, you can, what was it, grab him by the pussy, he'd have got fucking nowhere near the presidency. He had to be whiter than white, pardon the expression, but he did to get there. Yeah. Donald Trump, seriously, it is a cult. He could do anything. He could do anything. He said it himself. I could go, I could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and people, or whatever it was. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You know, remember when he did the thing where he mocked, he mocked the disabled guy? That should have been the end of it. That's the yeah. end of you. That's the end. In a decent society, that is the end of your candidacy for president of the United States of America. That's it. It's over. It wasn't. 
and it's just it's just spiraled and he's just he's buoyed every week by you know i can just say something more outrageous i can be more offensive i can tell people you know i can be more idiotic like you said the week tell people to inject bleach and they'll still vote for him and yeah. now you know i feel sorry for this the latest victim because i guarantee she's going to get absolutely hammered in the press she will um and by and large i don't think the people that are going to vote for donald trump and that we're going to vote for donald trump give a shit no they don't and and that's the problem isn't it it's like in the the what's most compelling about it and to show the the power of the cult that is donald trump and as him as a the media forces that behind him we're just um not on the back of but after the whole me too movement and you look at the likes of louis ck uh, woody allen mark ii um r kelly uh harvey weinstein you know if there was a time when the president was going to get taken down for doing sexual stuff, you know what I mean? It, that then now would be the time when that would, when that would happen. But it's great when you're talking about uh, Barack Obama being um, having a, a massively clean profile, and then you compare that to the likes of Bill Clinton, who was a who, who was shagging everybody, and then you had George W. Bush, who was a mad, who was a bad drunk, and then you got Donald Trump, and then in between it, you've got Barack Obama, and he was the one who was most vilified out of the fucking three of them. Yeah. I mean, he had to be, didn't he? he had to, like he couldn't have had anything going on. And you can talk about his predecessor. That's a different thing. Maybe the, some things that he did, predators he didn't agree with, because you know there's some things I didn't agree with that he did when he was president. But I'm talking about before he came to the White House, there was nothing there, you know. And you remember when they, they tried to um, label him as a terrorist, or he's a Muslim, or he's not. Yeah. He's not American. Remember the birther movement that Donald Trump championed? He's not American. Well, he is. All right, he's a Muslim. Well, he's not. He's a Christian. And this is the irony of this. this is how fucking stupid some of these people are. Donald Trump is no more a Christian than me and you are Buddhists, right? In fact, you're probably closer to Buddhism than he is to Christianity. Yeah, I'm, I actually, I'm a Buddhist, mate. Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> right, fucking hell, that's backfired on me massively, hasn't it? Hey, <laughs> fuck me. Um, <laughs> I could have picked any religion then. I would have got I know, yeah. Um, yeah, you know. <laughs> me and you are closer to Jediism. Than, um, than he is. Hey, I'm a Jedi. Yeah, oh, fuck, you know, he's got the lights here right now. I've got to give up. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he's not a Christian, Donald Trump. He isn't. No. Like, you know, you see the interview where he's asked about the Bible and he says, oh, yeah. You know, what's your favourite bit about the best of the Bible? Um, proper Alan Partridge in it. Oh, New, New Testament guy, Old Testament guy, uh, both. He just hasn't got a fucking jar of glue about the Bible. But he acts like he is a Christian and the, the Christian right lap it up. Barack Obama is a Christian, goes to church, has always gone to church, has a church that he always goes to. He's, you know, his kids have been Christian, every, the lot, the works, there's no denying it. Yeah, he was painted as a Muslim because that was seen as like, you know, that's a that's a way of getting, losing, making him lose votes. And he's, his middle name's Hussein. I mean, how fucking idiotic do you have to be? Come on. And this is the sort of the stuff you're dealing with. And, it, it, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. And it's a shame that Trump will probably sidestep all this, this flack. The only question is, is it is it the economy and other things that are going to un- undo him? Because, you know, as Bill Clinton said, it's the economy, stupid. And even though Bill Clinton had all those skeletons in his closet and when he ran for presidency, no one gave him a chance. You know, Bush was very popular following the Gulf War. Clinton had, you know, barely known from Arkansas, this little state, had, a, you know, affairs coming out of the woodwork, draft dodging with the Vietnam War, the White War, a scandal which turned out to be a big nothing burger. But at the time, it was seen as a scandal. Yet somehow he prevailed and he became president because it was the message and the economy and things like that. Now, instead of the economy and just the economy, it's also the pandemic and how it's been handled. And that may be Trump's undoing, but I certainly don't think his private life will be, even to the extent of, you know, sexual assaults. Yeah. He'll probably just get away with it. Teflon. The race to the White House continues. How long have we got left till it till till November the third? Is it November the third, man? And I'm you know I'm trying to sweet talk you into doing some Anna that night. Well, I, I'm I'm there, man. Chicken wings and and I'm gonna get one of them fucking big hats and stuff. We we we're, we're all over that shit. But listen, I've been Mata. Yeah, that's been Mata. Uh, thank you for watching again. Nine hundred and ninety-three subscribers. Uh, tell your friends. We're so close. To a thousand, uh, get, get make sure you're getting everybody else subscribing. And thanks for your comments and watching. We are across on Spotify, so if you can't even watch us on YouTube, as beautiful as both our faces are, you can always listen to the audio version. Um, so that's fantastic. But we shall very see you very, very soon.